During the course of a single year, at least one in five people suffers a mental illness or brain disorder. What's it like to lose control of your mind? How did they find help? Join us now as patients and families tell the stories of their fight to escape the fires of the mind. Depression's different from having a bad day. Depression is where your mood drops and it stays down and you can't get out of it. It's nothing you can will yourself out of. My son, Charlie, uh, killed himself uh, when he was 23 by jumping off the uh, overpass over the Santa Monica freeway one morning. We know that when manics get uh, severely ill, uh, their judgment's impaired. Very often they don't end up in the hospital, they end up in the county jail. My feeling about mania is that, that to surrender to mania, if you surrender to it, that you will get lost forever in some sort of a labyrinth that you cannot find your way back. It was a feeling that I couldn't stop pain in my head. So uh, life would be ridiculous to live. So it was like a favor to ask God to just let me die. Depression and manic depression kill as surely as heart attacks or cancers. Left untreated, 10 to 20 percent of these people commit suicide. Suicide Prevention Center, can I help you? When you say you cut yourself up, do you mean you try to commit suicide? Is there a gun in the house now? At hotline centers across America, Volunteers try to steer people away from committing suicide. It's a five, six, two area. Many of these callers are driven to self-destruction by the quiet killers, depression and manic depression. They really don't want to die, but the pain is so great inside that they say, I just don't think I can go on. Help me, please help me. Each year, 18 million Americans suffer from major depression. An additional 2.3 million are struck down annually with manic depression. In major depression, the patient's self-image is distorted by unrelenting grief that occurs for no apparent reason. Victims become indecisive and suffer from recurrent thoughts of death. In manic depression, a person's mood can soar from a depressed condition to a state of euphoria. Patients feel invincible and eventually lose their sense of judgment. When manic depression strikes, victims often don't seek help, and for good reason. In mania's early stages, the symptoms can actually feel good. Double check that. I just saw the At the abstract. University of California in Los Angeles, Dr. Lori Altschuler is a leading expert on manic depression. People can have symptoms that are called hypomania, where their self-confidence is higher, their creative energy feels greater than usual. They can spend all night up uh, writing or uh, feeling very creative, calling different people on the phone. They can begin to feel like their mind is racing, but not to the point where it feels pleasant, but to the point where it's racing too fast, that things are going by too quickly. People can start spending money impulsively, uh, or they uh, often get involved uh, indiscriminately with sexual partners. And then the most severe form of mania can either progress to or can just start out within a few days um, transitioning to uh, what we think of as psychotic mania, where people are very irritable. They're hearing voices and seeing things that may not be there. Highly creative people show a risk for manic depression. Novelists Ernest Hemingway and Virginia Woolf are among the most famous. Both were victims of suicide. Vincent van Gogh took his own life in 1890 and almost certainly suffered from manic depression. There would be times that he would paint dozens of canvases in a, a relatively short time, which some people believe may have been periods of mania. R. 
artist Nikki Davis's manic symptoms ranged from hypersexuality to fantastic delusions. Come on! Endowed with boundless talent as a young girl, she experienced a world filled with high energy thoughts and sensations. When I was a young teen, like around 14, 15, um, I didn't feel that there was anything different about times of racing thoughts and very elevated idealism, like dreams were a little explosive. I felt I could hear things and feel things. Debbie Davis was first to notice her sister's personality change, but she blamed Nikki's problems on a family crisis. Our parents were getting divorced, and there was a lot of crazy dysfunctional things happening within the family, and I was assuming that she was reacting to that. But I knew her so well that I, I knew something was wrong. She was not sleeping anymore. Her eating patterns had changed. She was a little too hyperactive. Graduating high school as valedictorian, Nikki Davis was accepted by the world-famous Philadelphia Art Academy. Over the years, her work appeared in some of New York's finest galleries. But on the road to artistic achievement, Nikki's career was sidetracked. When I was in my fourth year at the Academy, uh, I had a boyfriend who wanted to be a fashion photographer and I was a painting and printmaking major and very serious and very anti-fashion. Uh, but he finally convinced me one time to be on a shoot with him because the girl that he was doing test photos of needed doubles. The photographer's agent took one look at Nikki and knew she had the features and poise sought after by the fashion industry. Within a year of being discovered, Nikki Davis was living a dream as a fashion model in Paris. There, she roomed with her sister, Debbie, now a successful jazz singer and recording artist. When she got into her 20s and started modeling and came to Paris, we were able to recognize what was happening and, and it came to a head. While she couldn't put a name to it, Debbie saw something off base in Nikki's boundless energy. I didn't know then that that could have had any relationship with manic depression, but her behavior became more and more bizarre, which didn't matter in the modeling business because everybody's bizarre. While Nikki's manic vitality was a plus in the studio, it was starting to destroy her private life my relationships uh, were first full of energy and romance and highly sexual so my lovers absolutely loved it she would come home late and not sleep and be manic and people are calling all the time and she'd be out in the streets um, I many of the times would start a relationship right on top of the other literally I've had said to lovers I cannot stop myself from being with this person so I have to break up with you today because I'm seeing them in an hour and she's the gayest most incredible exuberant illuminated person that anybody could meet that's why she'd be getting all these jobs but it never shuts off and when she's living with me and she can't keep her body still at three or four o'clock in the morning I knew something was wrong I was finally making regular money in Paris, uh, but I noticed I was getting very sick. I was getting very agitated, and I was losing uh, rapid weight. She was speaking to spirits and her ancestor and our dead brother and poets and artists, and she was completely delusional. Her life slipping away, Nikki decided to return home to Washington. But when the day came, she was too weak to move. The day that I had to leave, I was so depressed and so sick that I couldn't finish packing. And all of a sudden, I felt the spirits were in the room, people I knew and didn't know, and we were going to pack my bag. I felt myself lift out of my body like people talk about in a near-death experience. Hoping to catch a flight from London to New York, Nikki crossed the channel to England 
By then, she was suffering intense delusions. I was dancing as if I was on stage, there on the deck of the hovercraft. While I'm listening to this music, I'm also getting messages that across the ocean, I'm going to link up telepathically with Michael Jackson and save the world. After a couple of days being in the United States, my mother had to come to some kind of decision and have the authorities come and, um, and, uh, and take her, um, uh, to a mental institution. It was a feeling that I couldn't stop pain in my head. So, uh, life would be ridiculous to live. So it was like a favor to ask God to just let me die. I was soon in a padded cell and my mother wanted someone to help her child now. Then I ended up committed in the state hospital. Last thing I remember, I was in heaven and now I've landed in hell. In Los Angeles, a manic fantasy led one woman to the brink of suicide. In the throes of undiagnosed manic depression, motion picture actress Mary Pat Gleason believed she could save a life by taking her own. I had a niece who was in an accident and she had gone into a coma. She had fallen on rollerblades and cracked the back of her skull open and was going in and out of a coma. And I was obsessing about this. This was what we call a mixed mania. That energy and the impulsivity was there. The lack of sleep was there, but the mood state was much different. It was a much darker, uh, more melancholic uh, view. At the UCLA Medical Center, Mary Pat's psychiatrist is Dr. Mark Fry. At that time, uh, uh, she had a niece that was seriously ill, and a lot of magical thoughts she was having was really revolving around this niece who was hospitalized uh, in the Midwest. And in the context of her racing thoughts and her delusional thinking was an idea that if she should die, in some way that would allow her niece to live. So it wasn't because nobody loved me and everybody hated me or... I couldn't go on with my life. It was an attempt to try to save hers. Chemical systems in the brain restrain impulsive behaviors such as suicide. Studies show that when manic depression disturbs this chemical balance, the results can prove fatal. Propelled by manic energy, Mary Pat took an overdose of sleeping pills. By chance, she left her front door open, a slip-up that saved her life. So I'm out on these pills, and these two friends come over, and they came in and grabbed me and took me to the shower. And I came to in the shower when the cold water hit me and said, um, am I alive? So they took me off to the doctors of that night. I was in UCLN neuropsychiatric and hospitalized for attempted suicide. I found myself diagnosed with bipolar disorder. Meanwhile, Mary Pat had been offered a role in a major feature film called Lorenzo's Oil. In a matter of days, the movie would start production in Pittsburgh. Under heavy medication, Gleason managed to hang on to the part with some extraordinary help from a close friend. Actress Marianne Muller-Liley offered to travel to Pittsburgh with Mary Pat and stay at her side through the filming. Marianne would take my arm and walk me to the set and hold me. They would call action and Marianne would release me and I would move forward with strength and confidence and do whatever I had to do. This is the best I could do on a moment's notice. It's one article from the Veterinary Science Journal about pigs, but at least it's on your long chain facts. Oh, well, thank you, Nicole. Please I'm very sorry. Oh, well, you're Italian. They would call cut, and it was like Pinocchio. Yeah. It was 
Complete collapse, and I'd do my hell doll shuffle back to my place, trembling hands and everything, and Marianne would be waiting for me, and she was like working with a prize fighter. She'd <laughs> kind of pat me and, oh, come here, pat, you're okay, you're, 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 you're okay, you're gonna get in, you're, you did great, you look, nobody knows you're nuts. <laughs> oh my, they're gonna know I'm nuts, Marianne. Today, Mary Pat Gleason's life is back on track. She now relies on medication to stabilize her brain chemistry and a network of friends to help her recognize signs of mania before they take center stage. When she first came out to Hollywood. While the symptoms of manic depression are clear, researchers struggle to learn how the illness actually operates in the brain. They can go to bed one night singing, feeling very grandiose, very elated, very euphoric, and wake up the next day unable to get out of bed uh, and almost mute. This to response. explore the mechanics of manic depression, Lori Altshuler and colleague Sue Buchheimer imaged the brains of manic depressive patients at UCLA. We're trying to learn about what makes bipolar patients different in the way their brains function from those who do not, do not have bipolar disorder. Buchheimer used a new technique called functional magnetic resonance imaging, or fMRI. While the patients perform various tasks, fMRI detects abnormal brain activity by measuring blood flow to each region. So what we've been doing is putting these patients with bipolar disorder when they're in an acute manic state in the scanner and showing them pictures that have these scary faces and doing some other tasks as well that stress other areas of the brain. Okay, this scan's going to be two minutes. Okay. Linked by intercom, patient volunteers view stock images of human faces known to provoke emotion. Okay, what you're now seeing in the goggles is a face with two words below it. You're going to need to use the response box to use your left button or your right button to determine which word most closely matches the emotion on the face above, okay? Okay. As the brain reacts to the photos, the effects on brain activity are seen in slices of anatomy from the surface to the core. A structure called the amygdala was not only enlarged in manic depressives, it was also very active. We have a region in the brain now that structurally looks different and we can begin to ask questions about when people are manic or depressed, what is actually the functioning of this brain region? So if we have a new treatment, for example, which we believe might be effective in bipolar disorder, one thing that we could do is to administer that treatment and see if this area of the brain starts to behave normally. In the near future, studies of the amygdala may produce a new generation of super drugs. In the meantime, the most effective treatment for manic depression is not a drug. It's called lithium. Lithium is an element that's found on the periodic table near sodium. In 1950, its effects were discovered by an Australian psychiatrist, John Cade. Cade hoped to create manic symptoms in guinea pigs using a toxic substance called urea mixed with lithium. Turned out that the ones that were receiving the lithium Uriate actually became sort of quiet, but they didn't go to sleep. So that was the smart thing. He said, ah, maybe I should give that to some of these excited people. In five to ten weeks, lithium stabilized bipolar patients who had been hospitalized for five to ten years. The amount of money that's saved from the invention of lithium as an intervention in manic depressive illness is the same as the federal government, approximately, spends on research into these tragic illnesses of schizophrenia, manic depressive disorder, and, and so on per year. Amazing. Yeah. 
Lithium treatments have given Chad Ebert a new hold on life. Today, he's rebuilding the bonds of family love destroyed by manic depression. Chad's parents, Leslie and Rob Ebert, hoped their son might one day join the family investment business. But early on, Leslie worried about her son's mood swings. His highs were very high. When Chad was up, he required so little sleep. He would just go and go and go. But then on the other hand, when he was low, it was as though he couldn't even get out of bed. Chad's undiagnosed manic depression intensified throughout high school. By age 21, he developed a mania for impulsive spending. I'd go out and you know, I'd go drop $600 that I couldn't afford at Nordstrom on clothes, but I'd have all these new clothes. And it felt good because I'd have new outfits for the next two weeks. There was just this inability to control money. No matter how much he made, he never had any. Leslie put her concerns aside when Chad joined the family's investment firm. His dad was especially delighted. He and Chad would go out on calls together and to see certain clients, and you could just see it. He, he was just so proud. While an asset to the business at first, Chad's mania demanded constant feeding. And I borrowed money from my parents to buy a new Volkswagen GTI um, on the condition that I sold the Jeep to reimburse them. So they loaned me the money, to, the cash to buy the GTI, but what I ended up doing was selling the Jeep and going on another grand spending spree with the money I sold that with. And so I never paid them back. Uh, you, you see highs and lows and you figure, well, he's high strung. You just don't think it, it's possible, you know, he's mentally ill. You know, you can be wrecking people left and right all the way down, but it's not a big thing because you're like, but I feel good, but I feel good. The day was May 20th, 1998. Um, the bank called. And the bank said, um, a check's just been presented, but I don't think you have funds to cover it. Your, your brain is going back and forth because you know you made the deposit, you know what checks you've written, and, and why isn't there money in the checking account? We found three checks that he had written for his own personal use. And I know one of them, he had had his dad sign. He would say, this check is going to be made payable to ABC Company, uh, and, and it was blank, and you know, I, I, I didn't think anything of it. I'd sign it. So he had literally embezzled money uh, from the firm. And, boy, you know, it was just like opening a floodgate. In his mania, Chad ran up $900 cell phone bills and opened unapproved company credit cards. The Eberts were lucky. They were out $17,000. Other victims of spending manias had lost homes and life savings. That was the day um, uh, we fired him. I, I, I terminated his employment with our firm. We would just hold each other and cry, pray, fall asleep crying every night i would go into the office the office was the hardest because that's where we all were a few weeks later chad was diagnosed with manic depression and began successful treatment with lithium we thought that was a major breakthrough because something now could could be done uh, i like to solve problems and this was a problem that had been difficult to solve now we could i still have a long way to go I really do. Um, I've lost a lot of friends, I've lost a lot of trust in a lot of people, but on the same account, things are looking better. At the Verdugo Mental Health Clinic, a special program assists families like the Eberts and patients like Chad. Here, support groups are a mix of patients and family members but no one is related. So your daughter has been basically gone for the first time out of home and now coming back. Right. And she She's, was gone how long? Uh, it'll be six, six months next month. So the problem Everyone gains home, from each other's insights it's, it's, and experiences. But, um, the result is a forum where criticism and advice can flow without the added intensity of family relationships. 
Right, kind of imitating the structure that she yeah. that Esther's daughter Anna is returning home after treatment for alcoholism and manic depression. Her mother is worried Anna may start drinking again. I see everything has got to do with trust here, and she's got to prove to you, and she knows she has to prove it to you. I'm thinking of what I did recently with my oldest son. Um, he sent me a plan of how he plans to uh, get himself sober. And I told him, you know, I want it in writing. I want your name signed to it. Now, I don't know how effective that's going to be. I have no idea. But there's something about writing things down, and especially signing your name, that might, might be helpful. All right, so that's one idea. Thank you, Geraldine. With help from the group, Esther decides the best way for her and her daughter to reestablish trust is to write down some rules of behavior. This helps me because this is like my little family that I get to come to every week. And then I get to talk, and then I get to learn, and then I get to listen. And it, there's always something there that applies to my life that I get from you guys. So thank you. The symptoms of manic depression are dramatic. But the incidence of the illness pales in comparison with the mood disorder of major depression. Major depression strikes some 5% of Americans. This statistic is not lost on Dr. Drew Pinsky. His television and internet programs on health reach millions of viewers. Welcome to another DrDrew.com show. Today, one of our first topic driven shows is going to be on depression. As soon as we sort of launch into a discussion about depression, all the calls tend to begin sort of shifting in that direction. Because there are 20 million people in this country with depression, uh, you open the door to discussing it and people want to talk about it. They, they're looking for answers. Nearly 18 million Americans suffer from major depression. That number could fall dramatically if more of them found early treatment. But an astonishing 9 out of 10 people are misdiagnosed or not diagnosed at all. One reason for this is that serious depression resembles a common emotional state we call the blues. People with depression often don't report their symptoms to health professionals because they assume their deep sadness is just a passing emotion. At UCLA's Neuropsychiatric Institute, Researchers see a relationship exists between depression and the memory centers in the frontal lobes of the brain. It's not the way you move your arms and legs, it's the way you think, communicate emotion, feel, etc. That's what we consider to be human. And all of that is wrapped up with memory, of course, and most of our memories are deposited in the frontal lobes of your brain. But on a depressed person, they have trouble retrieving memories in the same way as we do. They don't retrieve memories objectively. They tend to retrieve sad memories rather than positive memories. While research opens new windows on depression, the symptoms have been described for centuries. It's widely believed that Abraham Lincoln suffered from severe depression. I am now the most miserable man living. If what I feel were equally distributed to the whole human family, there would be not one cheerful face on earth. Like other sufferers, his illness may have had its roots in family genetics. Children of depressed parents are three times more likely to develop the disorder than children of non-depressed parents. But seeing the symptoms of mood disorders in children can be difficult. Children definitely get depressed. They, they perhaps don't show the consistency of depression that adults do, and therefore it's not as easily recognized. They tend to be more up and down in mood anyway, especially in adolescence when actually a lot of depression emerges. A child that's having irritable days, not doing well in school for a few weeks and then doing quite well in school, or having sleepless nights and then having 
good sleep, this type of inconsistency should make a parent concerned that there is something more going on than just uh, adolescence. If parents see exaggerated emotions of any kind, they should get their child to a psychologist. Ignoring these symptoms will only allow the depression to grow stronger. This was Denise Morrissey's fate. Her parents ignored her symptoms as well as their own. My dad used to um, drink a lot and I, he was an alcoholic. Um, he passed away in 98. When I look back now and I see the kind of behaviors that he had, he had all the symptoms of someone who was depressed and rather than seeking help, he, he would just try to, to numb the pain with alcohol. And my mother seemed to have a lot of the same symptoms too in terms of, you know, sleeping too much. I don't don't remember having the same energy that kids had where they were happy and running around screaming and doing that kind of thing. I just always felt a little bit less energetic and just so serious. By the time Denise reached her teens, her depression was life-threatening. In the picture, I'm smiling and I look happy like a normal teenager and I'm a cheerleader. And what people didn't know was that I was having a, a down episode um, and I wanted to kill myself. I was suicidal at this point. It was hard getting a doctor to take me seriously because I would hear these messages like, well, you've got everything going for you. You're young, you're in school, you're smart you know, you're pretty, things like that. What, what in the world do you have to be depressed about? Denise's chances for recovery got a boost with her marriage to a supportive husband, Jim. He will encourage me to get out and get some sun and walk around. If she's having a real rough night and she's sleeping in, and I have to be out of here by six in the morning most of the time, I'll leave her a note, I'll leave her just, just letting her know that I know what she's going through. But Denise's first line of defense is her antidepressant medication. People who've never been on medication before will say, well, you don't need a drug to feel happy all the time. And that's not what happens. I mean, it stabilizes you. You still go through these episodes of depression, but they're not as severe and you can still have a normal life and have your relationships. It doesn't have to ruin your life. One of the most successful medications controls a chemical in the brain called serotonin, a neurotransmitter that moderates human behavior and mood. Called serotonin reuptake inhibitors, they travel into the minute gaps between brain cells to regulate the amounts of serotonin, dramatically decreasing symptoms. Today, a wide variety of antidepressive drugs exist because no single medication works for everyone. Patients may try several antidepressant drugs before they find the right one for them. That can lead to trouble, according to Dr. Andy Luchter. Patients are very easily discouraged. They didn't want to come in necessarily to begin with, and once they get a medication or psychotherapy, if they don't start to see some improvement early on, they may say, you know, forget it. And the problem is that more and more data are showing that if we don't get it right the first time, that patient may be lost to us. I am now on my sixth medication, and it's a very rocky road. And my understanding is that most people don't stick with it. Diagnosed two years ago, Trudy Hinckley tried one medication after the other. 
In the meantime, she struggled with another effect of depression, the guilt patients feel. Part of the hell of depression is not being able to um, access the joy of having healthy children, of having a wonderful family, all these things that we should be happy about and thankful for. Um, I just couldn't feel it. As her illness deepened, she felt more and more detached from her husband and children. I remember I looked into the mirror and just didn't connect with the image at all. I definitely wasn't interested in sex anymore. I was very irritable. I was yelling a lot. I felt helpless in that. Um, of course, I would take care of the kids and, you know, get the things done that needed to be done practical-wise, but uh, here was my wife suffering immensely, and I was just not equipped, really, to do anything for her. My biggest fear was what the impact of my illness would have on my children. A lot of the time when she was depressed, she would scream at me a lot for no reason when I didn't do anything. And afterwards, she would apologize and tell me that she wasn't well, she was depressed, nothing was my fault. I tried to know being nicer to her, but it didn't really work that much because, you know, she was depressed. I did my best, but really it didn't work that much. Trudy's son, William, was in his infancy during the worst part of her depression. Obviously, I was ill when he was very little, so he was at home with me. I couldn't be with him. I couldn't sit and play with him. I, it was hard for me to read a story to him. Next, the measured tramp of a great war horse made his heart beat. A psychotherapist helped Trudy confront the guilt she felt towards her family. But finding the right medication continued to be a problem. Trudy decided to take action by joining a groundbreaking research effort at UCLA. Hi, Trudy. The goal is to find a faster way to match the right medication to the right patient before they give up hope. That doesn't hurt or anything. Using gel to establish good contact, a special cap containing electrodes is placed on Trudy's head. Okay, let's go over to the bed. Okay. Called quantitative EEG, the purpose of this ungainly headgear is to detect the electrical activity in Trudy's brain under an antidepressant drug. Once converted to digital information, researchers will be able to look at brain function before medication as well as during the course of treatment. The study led by Dr. Andy Luchter revealed regions of the brain affected by the illness. Blood flow to the brain is commonly decreased in a patient with depression. In addition, there are certain specific areas that may be particularly responsible for depression. One area is the prefrontal region of the brain that is responsible for our ability to plan, our ability to focus, to carry out our day-to-day -day activities. The prefrontal zone surrendered the biggest clues to the effectiveness of antidepressant drugs. Expressed in these stylized top views of the brain, QEEG data shows the blue-colored prefrontal regions are being normalized by medication. And we see changes in brain function that predict that somebody's going to get better two, three, or four weeks down the road, even after just the first couple of doses. Volunteers like Trudy are helping researchers gain ground on depression. In the meantime, across America, thousands of lives remain at risk. 
10 to 15 percent of depressed patients every year end up committing suicide. So it really is imperative that we recognize depression and get patients in for treatment as quickly and effectively as we can. This year's suicides will outnumber homicides in America by roughly three to two. Approximately 30,000 Americans will kill themselves annually. The strongest risk factor is depression. More young adults die of suicide than from all natural causes combined, including cancer, heart disease, AIDS, pneumonia, and chronic lung disease. It was right down that way, over the cliff, all the way down. Other 17 years ago, Sam and Lois Bloom lost their son, Sammy, when he drove his car off this ledge in Palos Verdes, California. Matthew and David wonder what it would be like if their uncle, Sammy, was still alive. Along with their mom, grandmother, and granddad, they visit the spot where suicide claimed Sammy's life and changed theirs forever. He was a great kid. He, he was a lot of fun. He liked to laugh. He liked to hug you. He, he loved people. He could talk to anybody, you know, no matter what age. He, he was kind of the leader of his, he and his sisters, and they played together a lot. As he grew up, he got him involved in Boy Scouts, and uh, he and I had a thing going of uh, going backpacking. Our last trip was uh, in the summer of 1981. That was a good time. It was about a year and a half before his death. He was very active in school. He uh, played basketball and um, golf, and that was his favorite, of course. He played every day. In his junior year of college, Sammy withdrew from sports as he became obsessed with spirituality. It seemed to be a little bit more than what the normal. We, we saw some uh, changes, which we didn't identify because we were not knowledgeable about the various mental illnesses. Without warning, Sammy joined a religious cult and disappeared for almost a month. When Sammy came home, he was uh, um, bright-eyed. He had this glazed look um, that, you know, you don't expect. When he came back, he clearly was, 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 was uh, upset, agitated, uh, became paranoid. One night, his sister Lisa found him contemplating suicide. I went out in the garage and he was standing there with a screwdriver in his hand. And I said, Sammy, you don't want to do that. And he said, yeah, I do. And I said, no, you don't hand it to me. And he handed it to me at that point. Taken to a psychiatric hospital, Sammy was diagnosed with manic depression. He um, was in the hospital for three months. Um, medication all uh, reversed on him. Uh, wasn't uh, a good experience medication-wise. Um, lost uh, a lot of weight, uh, stopped talking to us, curled up in a ball. Released after weeks of psychotherapy and medication, Sammy seemed improved, but it didn't last. At Thanksgiving, he, he, he had uh, definite signs of major depression was coming back, and, and we didn't know it at the time the doctor was reducing his medication. I thought that would be uh, something to be really concerned about. And so I tried to get a hold of his therapist, and his uh, therapist said that I was overreacting again and I should uh, butt out. I didn't trust that, but I felt like he knew better than I did. That following weekend, we had a good weekend with Sammy. It was almost like, you know, it was almost like a high. So the next morning, on Monday, um, I kissed him goodbye. He was still in bed and said I'd see him that night. And he said, I'll see you, Mom. And that was the last time I saw him alive. When Sammy ended his struggle with suicide, 
his mother began hers. Lois was convinced that if she had gotten home on time that night from work, Sammy would have killed himself. You know, I felt like, you know, I can't, I can't live with this. I can't live with this pain. It was, it's just too much. Um, and so, yeah, I did. I considered suicide, and and uh, um, I saved up my my medication. I had sleeping pills, and Sam happened to be aware of of that. We were taking a walk, and he said. Uh, Hun, are you thinking about killing yourself? And I said, yes, I am. And he said, um, why would you do that? And I said, I can't stand this pain. Lois and Sam confronted their anguish at a support group called Survivors After Suicide. Programs like these can now be found in many cities. The meetings are led by a survivor along with a trained therapist. And I had the, the program helps members heal by discussing their experiences with others. A few days later, I lost my son when he was 26 years old to overdose and from an injection. My son Charlie uh, killed himself uh, when he was 23 by jumping off the uh, overpass over the Santa Monica freeway mm -hmm. one morning. I lost my son David to suicide. He shot himself. He was 27 years old. And uh, we celebrated his um, anniversary of death, I'm sorry, uh, the 17th of April. By the end of the eight weeks, they've made some relationships that, uh, that oftentimes extend outside of the group. So it does provide uh, a safe place, a place that they're not judged, and oftentimes they don't have that anywhere else. She herself... Even years after a life's been lost, there's still a lot of feelings and advice to share. It has helped a lot. One of the things that helped me the most after my son killed himself was that uh, my closest friends uh, came to my house every day for a week and sat with me all day long. And uh, I can't talk with our but uh, it was it was very good because they didn't come with any kind of judgment. They didn't come with any kind of, you know, pious homilies about, you know, this is God's way or something. They didn't have any of that, but they just sat with me and they uh, let me cry. <laughs> I think my own experience has been that uh, in the beginning I would cry on the freeway every night on the way home. And, and now there's times when uh, I can think of Sammy and just smile. And, and so I've been able to ret retain the good memories and they're integrated with me. And uh, I think that's a good way to, uh, to go on with your life and, and a good way to heal. Coping with depression and manic depression requires a lifetime of vigilance. But the good news is that patients can have a future like anyone else. Today, Trudy Hinckley works with children as an aftercare teacher at a private school. Mary Pat Gleason is acting in a new feature film on location in Alabama. Denise Morrissey is a technical writer in Santa Monica, California. And Nikki Davis found medication that stabilized her manic depression. She's begun to paint again and has returned part-time to college. So I can't feel sorry for myself. All I got to do is make it to the next step. It's incredible to realize that you can look at yourself in the mirror and say, I'm alive and I'm doing the best that I can. There's so much out there. There's so much mental illness out there that people aren't even aware of. They battle it every day, and they don't even know they don't have to have this battle, that there's help. I'm Mary Pat Gleason. I deal with mental illness. My dis-ease is bipolar. I'm happy to say it. I'm working on it.